Yeah. <laughs> Don't with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? Really the brother did. did the brother. That's what I thought too. Yeah. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, did you just talk, talk about death? death? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mystery murder thing. Yep, that's how I'm. Uh, Is that get our new up. theme song? That's our theme song. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, because I'm actually editing this one, so <laughs> I can just like fade that in. <laughs> Yay! That kind of hurts. Yeah, it's, it's it's just a mild slap. Welcome to Mystery Murdery Thingy. Oh, yeah. Welcome to our podcast. I'm Chloe. <laughs> I'm Mario. We talk about mysteries. And murderies. And thingies. And thingies. And some weird shit. And mysteries. Sometimes we literally talk about shit. Um, yeah. There was another true. shit story in the in the news. Oh, really? It was pretty... It was kind of stupid. They're usually kind of stupid. People were putting big, um pictures of Nicolas Cage next, next to dog poop that people didn't pick up. <laughs> Why Nicolas Cage? I don't know. Because he's a piece of crap. <laughs> Is he? I mean, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I like a few of the things he's done. I really like Wild at Heart, David Lynch movie. He's amazing in that with Laura Dern. Okay. Also, Raising Arizona. Okay. Super good. And then what's the other Nick Cage movie I usually say? Oh, shit, I can't think of it. I love National Treasure. I know, you're, like, obsessed with National Treasure. I'm not obsessed with National tre- National Treasure. You're, like, gonna go to Washington, D.C. and, like, try to find it and shit. What was it about? It's not the Constitution? at all. Something written on the back? Yeah, there was a map to the city of gold. Right. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was kind of a dumb story. I, I mean, liked it. Yeah, I mean, it was okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> most of his shit's kind of stupid. No, most people don't like it. Yeah, no, that's that's. I'm like uh, definitely one of those people who like if a, if I think a movie's bad, then it's really bad. Right. <laughs> you tend to have a pretty forgiving attitude when it comes to movies. Yeah, people are always like, "Oh my god, that movie's so bad," and I'm like, "Oh, haha, yeah, it was awful." I also thought that. Yeah. <laughs> I too believe that statement. <laughs> Whatever you think. <laughs> yep. Okay, do you want to go first or second or first or second or third or second or first? I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Because I always want to go first. Okay. Okay. I want more taffy. Did, I, I guess. I mean, I'm going to edit this, right? So. Oh, I was going to make it part of the thing. Oh, really? So we have to eat candy while we record. No, I have to eat. Rule. I have to eat while you talk. Oh, I don't eat while I talk. No, <laughs> that makes more sense. Okay, so I've uh, been doing a lot of like thingies, right? Like the science and the aliens and stuff. So I wanted to get back to doing some murdery shit. Uh, back, you know, to our our murder our roots. murder roots here. Our <laughs> bloody red dripping roots. Uh, so I'm gonna do the murder. <laughs> gross. Uh, so I'm gonna do the murder of Giovanni Borgia. So this is like super classic, right? Because it actually happened in 1497, way back in 1490. Picture it, Rome, 1497. Uh, I'm I'm wearing my squat shirt right now, so that's why I thought of the Golden Girls. I was doing, you know, the Ma, the, you know. Picture it. You know yeah, what I'm doing. Okay. I know what you mean. Yes. <laughs> so watch Golden Girls if you don't know what I mean. So on the evening of June 14th, 1497, in a fashionable part of Rome, mm-hmm. Giovanni Borgia, a.k.a. Juan Borgia, Duke of Gandia, and the son of Pope Alexander VI had just finished a dinner in his honor. Oh, wow. Super fancy affair. Oh, look at me. I'm Giovanni. Very oh. posh. Yeah, it was more like, yeah, I'm fucking Giovanni Borgia. I am better than all of you people. Was he a bro? <laughs> kind of. He was kind of <laughs> a bro. He was apparently also just like super into himself. He was like the middle kid and he was his dad's fucking favorite. Yeah, middle kids. Woo! And he got anything he wanted. Um, including 
other people's wives, as we'll talk about. So he had just finished having this dinner in his honor, which his mom, Venosa de Catini, had thrown for him. His brother was there, Cesare, uh, who was a cardinal. His, Caesar? Uh, um, Caesar, Cesare. Um, Whatever. They're, yeah, they're, there's kind of different ways of saying this. Um, they're originally Spanish. That's why he's also known as Juan Borgia. Uh, so his brother was there, his older brother, his younger brother, Joffrey, was there. His sister, Lucrezia, was there. All of the, you know, love that name. highlights of, uh, you know, um, whatever the, the social scene in Rome were there. Who was also there was a masked figure who had been visiting what? Giovanni for about the past month every night. Came up, up and... Well, that's that's kind of the, the implication, yeah. Ooh. Um so when Giovanni and the rest of the party left, you know, his brother Cesare was like, Hey Giovanni, it's getting kinda late. I think we should go back to the palace, you know, uh it's been a great night, but let's wrap it up here. My bro oh brother of mine. Uh, -huh. uh and maybe he did that because like Giovanni was being real fucking drunk and pompous. Because apparently that was kind of his MO. When they left though, they were you know, getting on their horses, packing up their mules and such, and because this is the Renaissance, and the, and the masked figure appeared again. Giovanni told his brother and the rest of the party, hey, uh, you guys get going. I'm actually, I, I gotta go uh, pay a visit of pleasure, as one uh, source uh, termed it, uh, essentially a Renaissance booty call. So, uh, Okay. Yeah, apparently Giovanni was uh, quite the player around town. Uh, he was uh, <laughs> he was getting it. Uh, yeah, he he was a uh, kind of a dog, uh, one might say. And this um, you know kind of uh, player you know mentality that he had uh, included you know not just you know sex workers and you know uh, you know maids or whatever but also uh, apparently other people's wives Ooh, including scandalous yep uh, rumored trysts with his little brother's wife Sancha now which what you have to understand is that Sancha was like 16 when oh. she married uh, Giovanni's younger brother Joffrey, what, he was like twelve. It, it was what? like a, it was a marriage, as these things always are. It was like a marriage to like cement an alliance. Okay. So Sancha's parents were, your children. I think, the um, like the eventual king and queen of Naples, I think, and the, nipples. Yes, of nipples, <laughs> <laughs> and she married, you know, Joffrey to like make this alliance with the with the Borgia family, with the Pope. So Giovanni uh, told, okay, so um, and, and yeah, so she was like sleeping around with a lot of people, uh, including he? apparently Giovanni. No, she was Sancha. Oh, so like, they were both sleeping around. So uh, yeah, and this obviously kind of you know pissed off uh, Joffrey as well as we'll get to. So Giovanni. His staffiero, or footman, and that masked figure rode off, the masked figure riding behind Giovanni. Okay. Which would, again, seem to suggest this is, like, you know, someone he's going to go hook up with, right? Yeah. That's, like, what it seems like. So they go into kind of a rougher part of town, reportedly the Jewish ghetto. Because, again, this is Renaissance Italy. <laughs> Lots of anti-Semitism abounded at that time in that place, obviously. Yeah. Um, Giovanni dismissed his footman, told him, you know, hey, wait for me here. If I don't come back, you know, in a little while, you just you just go home. I'm going to do my thing. You know, I'm going to go do my thing, Giovanni. Is that yeah. what he said? Is uh, that an exact that quote? That is an exact quote. I was actually there listening, and I wrote <laughs> it down, so I made sure to know. So when, uh, you know, Giovanni didn't appear, the footman started going on his way. Uh, but, the, you know, th th this was kind of like the normal thing that happened, right? He would go out, get drunk, and then he would go, you know, have one of his little hookups. So nothing was, they didn't think anything was amiss at this point. However, what was kind of strange was that Giovanni didn't turn up the next day. So they didn't see him all day. The servants start getting a, kind of alarmed 
and they tell Pope Dad, Alexander the Sixth, Pope that, Dad, Pope Dad, hey Pope Dad, uh, money please, money please, um, <laughs> and he was happy to give it. Uh, so Alexander the Sixth, uh, he, you know, the Pope, he was like, uh, you know, it's fine. He went, he hooked up with some lady. Good for him. I certainly do it because. I'm Pope the Alexander Pope. VI had, like, four different mistresses and at least eight different children. And what was kind of interesting about him, actually, just to digress, Alexander VI, you know, popes at this time and many other times, of course, have had, you know, sex with many different kinds of people in different contexts. Like, that happens all the time. Completely normal thing. Uh, before, like, you know, kind of the, the immediate past. But... What was unusual about Pope Alexander the Sixth was that he didn't give a shit, and he didn't try to hide it by saying that they were like oh. his nieces and nephews. He was just like, yeah, no, these are my kids, and yeah, you're gonna that one's gonna become a cardinal, this one's gonna become a duke. Um, that wow. you know he'll be the pope after me, whatever. So maybe because he was open, people were like, I guess. Because he's the Pope, or... Essentially, yes. Especially when you're in the this pope, time when you're the Pope. Oh, yeah. The, the Pope was the most powerful person in at least Europe at this time. Like, kings and queens had to go to him for permission to do stuff. Oh. So that's, like, really important to understand. That, like, he was, like, the absolute ruler, in a sense, not only of the Papal States, which, you know, he was formally, but also of, like, you know, the, the wire area. So the Borgias are, like, extremely extremely powerful which of course made them lots of friends that they could help yeah. but also lots of enemies too right so you know the the pope alexander the sixth this you know debaucherous guy but apparently a very devoted father um he wasn't too worried about giovanni he's like okay you know he's out he went out whatever maybe you know he just doesn't want to do the walk of shame back to the palace yeah you know he'll wait until the sun goes down and then he'll slink his way home and Probably do the same thing all over again, which is great. Uh, but when the sun did go down and Giovanni still hadn't down. turned up, the <laughs> Pope started to panic. And he ordered a search and an investigation. Ooh. He got together, you know, like 300 plus guys Ooh. and said, like, go out there, you know, find my son. Find my son! Because he, not only was he um, his son, he was also the head of the army Oh, fuck. He was, you know, the this, like, you know, super important duke. So it wasn't like he could just fuck off and do whatever he wanted, right? Yeah. He, he wouldn't disappear for days. He has responsibilities. Yeah, he's got stuff to do. Right. So the search turned up his injured footman, who apparently had been, like, badly wounded after he went to go back to the palace. So he he was not dead, but he couldn't really give a coherent account of what happened. And they also found Giovanni's horse with one broken stirrup. Oh. Which was not a good sign, right? It's kind of like in Beauty and the Beast when the horse runs back and Belle finds him and is like, oh, what happened? You know, it's it's not Papa. good. Papa! 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 Yeah. I have to go find him. <laughs> um, and the rest. <laughs> Let's just retell the, the rest of... Uh, <laughs> Of uh, Beauty and the Beast from there, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the investigation, though, did turn up a witness, Giorgio Schiavoni, who was a fisherman who claimed to have been on the Tiber River on the night of the disappearance and seen a body being thrown into the river oh. by these two guys. So according to Giorgio, while he was throwing some junk off of his boat into the part of the river where people throw their junk because apparently that was like a thing. Yeah. He Sounds saw, about right. <laughs> right. He saw two men sneaking around. They were kind of like making sure the coast was clear. They didn't see anyone there. They didn't see him because it was like pitch dark. Yeah. And a little while later, two more men arrived Again, took a real thorough look around, made sure the coast was not, clear. Not too thorough. Right. Um, not thorough enough. Not to, thorough enough. To find Giorgio, who apparently is just like, you know, fades into the darkness, I guess, uh, real easily. Um, they arrived with a body loaded on a horse. They, again, you know. I'm imagining like a black Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> right. <it's, laughs> yeah, no, it's a fucking horse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with the body like slunk over it. And once they made sure they were alone, they 
threw the body into the river. Um, and then this other guy who was like their supervisor or something was like, Hey, did you like throw it in the river? And they were like, yes, sir. We threw it in the river. And then there was like some piece of clothing like floating on there. Ooh. And the guy like threw rocks at it until it until sunk. It so there wouldn't be like any evidence. So Georgia told the authorities this and they were like, uh, okay, well, why didn't you come tell us? Like a body got thrown in the river. Like, did you not think that was something we should know about? And Georgia's response was like pretty fucking classic. So he was like, yeah, um, I've seen about a hundred bodies, like literally over a hundred bodies thrown into the Tiber before just like this. And no one has ever asked me about it. So I just didn't really think it was that important. <gasps> yep. What? That was like literally his response. It was like, yep, no one cared before. So I, why, I, why should I care? I don't know how I feel about that. You know how I feel about that? Yeah, I actually Rome do. was a dangerous fucking place in fucking the late 15th century, early 16th century. So I guess you would want to keep your mouth shut. Right. No, that's definitely true. And they say that this is like, you know, some of the precursors of the mob. Right. Oh. You know, swimming with the fishes and so forth. Yeah. And the cone of silence. And, you know, yeah, you, you don't want to be the rat. You know, because... Snitches get stitches. Do get stitches, yes. <laughs> or worse. Or worse. <laughs> they get thrown in a fucking river. <laughs> so the fishermen, after they heard the story, were enlisted to search the river where Giovanni's body was eventually found. When it was found, the throat had been slit, uh, and about eight or nine stab wounds were oh, found no. all over the torso, the neck, and so forth. That's fucked up. That's brutal. <laughs> Very, very brutal killing. This was, it seemed, a sort of crime of passion or, you know, just a, an assassin who had wanted to be, you know, extremely thorough, I suppose. What they also found in the body was all of the nice, really nice clothing and a full coin purse. So, in other words, this was not a robbery gone wrong. This was an assassination. Shit. Right. So the Pope, Alexander VI, Giovanni's dad, was understandably, you know, enraged and inconsolable for days. Yeah. He refused to leave his room. Like, he wouldn't. He didn't want to let them in. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to sleep. But after, you know, like four days of just, like, intense, intense mourning, he, did, he said that, like, basically he felt like he was starting to endanger his own life. So he started kind of, like, getting back into it, you know, eating and, and sleeping and so forth. But he ordered, like, a really thorough investigation into what happened. Um, because, you know, again, he was, like, you know, super enraged. But what's weird is that for some mysterious reason, he abruptly ended the investigation a week later. And no one knows why. People, I bet he was gay. Who? Giovanni. Well, what does that have to do with it? Maybe they, like, found out where he went that night. Maybe they found out who he was hooking up with. Maybe. I don't know. But You know, because if they did an investigation, they're going to, like, all right, where did he go? Who was he with? Where did you guys drop him off? Who lives here? Right, right, of who course. Who is this person? But what I, what I think it um, might also point to is that, again, yes, they found out what happened or, like, they were pretty sure... And it was just somebody that they either didn't want to get in trouble or, like, couldn't afford to get in trouble. Okay, okay. I think that's maybe a little more likely. I mean, what you're saying, like, could possibly be the case, but there's, like, no evidence. There's no real reason to think yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But that's kind of how it is with a lot of the suspects. And that's why this one is, like, so much of a mystery as well. And, of course, because the investigation, like, was not really finished. It was just kind of, like, abruptly ended for... Like, some reason. So there are many, like, hypotheses of, like, who killed Giovanni and why. Many people think that it had to do with an affair, since, you know, he was, like, such a dog. Yeah. Like, you know, clearly that's a thing that people kill over a lot. Yeah. So that seems like a natural play, like, There's first place to There's a whole ID look. series on it called Fatal Attraction. Right. <laughs> Other people think it may have had to do with family dynamics because the Borgias were, of course, this, you know, super powerful family. And there were a lot of dynamics within it that 
could have caused someone to have a legitimate motive for murder. And of course, they all had the means and the opportunity to do it. Still, other theories think that he was a victim of the rivalries amongst the more important families of Rome. So, you know, family dynamics, but on a wider scale. Feuds. Feuds and such. Vendettas, right? So let's kind of go through the suspects. So first of all, his brother, Cesare, Caesar. Now, there's no evidence linking him to the crime. So that should be pointed out right at the outset. There's no, like, physical evidence at all, like, that he he was involved whatsoever. But there were rumors of in, his involvement that were started in Venice the next year. And there was a circumstantial case against him, essentially people saying, you know, he told this person and they told me that oh, he killed him. It's hearsay, exactly. Now, Venice, you should also know, is the center of power for uh, one of the families that the Borgias were rivals with. So take it with a grain of salt, right? Yeah. And again, only circumstantial evidence against him. Trying to ruin his reputation. Right. So, however, he was, Caesar was reportedly very jealous of his brother's position as the Duke of Gandia. So in those times, a prominent family would typically have the eldest son go into politics and the other son go into the church, which is essentially also politics, but just the other side of politics. And that's where you see, you know, Giovanni being the duke and Cesare being the cardinal. And then okay. eventually the pope, right? Yes. So in this family, however, Giovanni, the younger brother, got to have that position as the political leader and as the military leader. And apparently he was not very good at it. Mm. Like, especially the military side of it. Yeah. He had these, like, embarrassing defeats oh, and was just, like, not a good role. Maybe partly because he was just, like, drunk and trying to get his dick wet most of the time instead <laughs> of, like, you know, figuring out what the best military strategy would be or yeah. things of that nature. I mean, that's it, 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 just a wild speculation. Just, uh, just, just a maybe, guess. Maybe, maybe that was it. So Cesare apparently was a very good military tactician. It's just that his daddy didn't like him as much. So, you know, the way I think of this was kind of Cesare was Fredo to Giovanni's Michael, if we want to talk in godfather terms. Except that instead of being an idiot, Cesare was actually smart, unlike Fredo, who was kind of an idiot, so it made sense. But when, you know, Giovanni did die, Cesare was able to take over that kind of position. He actually resigned as cardinal and became the military leader of the Papal States and kind of got that life that he wanted in a sense, although he died not too long after in a battle. So that's like a possible motive. Right. So that's a possible motive. Oh, and then he died in a battle? He died in a battle like several years later. Some have even said that another motive for Cesare having killed Giovanni was jealousy in an incestual love triangle with their sister Lucrezia. Oh. Because there's, there have been these, like, persistent rumors of incest against the Borgias. Like, I, I'm given to understand that that's a part of, like, the TV series about them and things like that. I'm not sure, because I've never seen it. Is it... Lu- isn't it Lucrezia? Lucretia, Lucrezia, the you, you can say them in kind of different ways, but um, like uh, Giovanni or Juan or John or Caesar or Cesare, um, but you know the, all of this stuff, like the incest, the the you know Caesar being involved, all of that stuff, it's all just based on rumor. So it, it, I don't know, I I don't put too much stock in it. Who knows whether yeah. those things happened or not. Um, Whereas, you know, some some of these other ones seem a little more plausible, like um, that it had to do with a vendetta that the Borgias were having with the Orsinis. Is that their rivals? Right. That's like the, the rival family, the Orsinis. And they actually had been having like battles with them for lands between the Borgias and the Orsinis the previous winter. And during that, the Duke of Urbino, which was he was a prominent member of the Orsini family, was actually imprisoned by Giovanni and the leader of the family, Virginio, was put in the dungeon of Castel Sant'Angelo by Pope Alexander VI Ouch. and died there. 
So there was a lot oh, of bad blood. So there is, yeah, lots and lots of bad blood between the um, between the Borgias and the Orsinis. So it's a very natural place to look. And the again, the murder was clearly an assassination. Yeah. So it would kind of make sense in that in that way as well. But again, there's no hard evidence. There, there never could be since it happened over 500 years ago, and they didn't do that at the time. It's just, like, impossible to know. The other main theory is that it was a jealous husband who killed Giovanni. According to this theory, the supposed, you know, husband or boyfriend or whoever... Of one of his lovers? Of one of his lovers, you know, caught him boinking with the lover. <laughs> uh, it wasn't me. But you caught me red-handed, banging on the bathroom floor. Um, <laughs> so that, that that husband or boyfriend got, like, mad and, you know, basically Picture killed him. Picture this. We were both butt naked, banging on the bathroom floor. Right. That's it. That's it. Maybe they were <laughs> banging on the bathroom floor. Who knows? It could be. Um, so one of those jealous husbands was, again, his little brother, Giovanni's little brother, Joffrey. So he may have been behind it for that reason. And again, he would have had the same opportunity and motive. To be the leader? Right, to be the one, you know, who organized the murder and, like, uh, not necessarily carried it out, but, you know, paid someone to do it and things like that. that that's kind of the main idea is that one of his family members or a member of the Orsini family paid a trained assassin of which apparently there were many, many in Rome at this time, <laughs> private mercenaries. That's kind of cool. As they were called, right? Um, who, you know, would just kind of do these things. That sounds like a good story. Of a private mercenary? Yeah, but in Rome. In Rome, yeah, exactly. That could definitely be like a historical novel or something. I bet there's been probably tons of them. So again, since the investigation was abruptly ended over 500 years ago, we'll, we'll never really know who killed Giovanni um, Giovanni Borgia, but I, I think it's a really interesting story. And, that is an interesting story. You know, just because it's so mysterious and it gets into these like family dynamics with the Borgias, which it's just like a, so, per, I mean, there's like a show about it going on right now on like whatever HBO or whatever, because they're like so intriguing. Really? Yeah. What's it called? Uh, it's called the Borgias, I think. Is it? Wait. I think it's on HBO. Oh, but it's not apparently terribly historically accurate. I don't care. And they essentially <laughs> just, like, pick one of these series. I think they have it where J Joffrey killed him, I think. Oh, okay. Or Cesar, one of the two brothers. And that's the most, like, interesting theory, I think, is that it's, like, yeah. it was a family member who did it. And as we were talking about, it usually is. <laughs> someone you know, yeah. Someone you know, someone in your family, someone close to you. So, anyway, my sources for this one... Uh, of course, Wikipedia. Hey! Yep, love that Wikipedia. Uh, the Giovanni Borgia page. Uh, also, uh, Ezra Pound via the Contos Project uh, website. So it, the, Ezra Pound was a um, historian, uh, writer uh, from the early to mid-20th century and wrote a lot of history and, and had like a really good little... Um, you know, uh, section on, on the killing of, uh, Giovanni Borgia. Also the loyalty binds me blog by Sam. She didn't give her last name, but she's uh, an archeology span student and like a, uh, kind of amateur historian who did a, a blog post about it. And also Carol King from Italy magazine. Yay. So, yeah. That's my story for this week. Yay. Okay, all right. Okay, now you go. Okay, my turn? Yeah. So, let's do this. Okay, so, first, a correction. Okay. So, last episode on the aliens, I called it, like, the AAFIP. Oh, right. And we were, we like, figure about, out what right. it was. It turns the AATIP, mm. the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program. It was the program revealed to the public in December of 2017 as being a government-funded project to study UFOs. Right. And it was Harry Reid who was, like, leading it, right? It was, like, yeah, it was, like, a senator or something. Yeah. Um, and it went from 2007 to 2012, and there was a total of $22 million put into it. Right. So, Which is yes. not really that much. I know. In the, like, grand, in the scheme, grand scheme of, of, of things, the government yeah. budget. It's, like, 
tiny, tiny. It it actually was just like hidden. That's how small it was. Yes, but um, so I was not making it up. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone thought you were making it up. <laughs> Actually, you were really close. What did you say? A A F I P and A T. Yeah, and then we looked it up. It was like something in like Spanish. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a heist. Do 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 do. So it okay. So there was a huge. This was in 1990. At a huge, at a, a beautiful, beautiful museum called the Isabella Gardner Museum. It's in Boston, Massachusetts. It opened New Year's Day in 1903. It has um, 15,000 pieces of art. And it's basically um, a private art collection of um, a woman named Isabella Gardner hmm. who... Uh, basically made her art collection into a museum and it has European, Asian and American influenced art. So it's got sculptures, paintings, tapestries, and lots of decorative art like vases and That's really cool. stuff like that. Um and I saw pictures, it's really pretty. It's designed to look like a 15th century Venetian palace. Ooh. Um and the most valuable work housed there is Titian's Rape of Europa. Mm. Yeah, Titian. 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 One of the masters. So let's talk about Isabella Gardner. So she was an art collector, a philanthropist. Um, She, a lot of her life, she traveled the world with her husband. And then in 1891, she inherited $1.75 million. This is in 1891. Wow. And today that's over $45 million. It's a whole lot of money. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um... So she inherited it from her father after his death, and this is when she started collecting art. Um, her first major purchase was uh, Vermeer's The Concert, and after an auction. Uh, so she made her house into a museum. Or no, not her house. She, she, she made the museum after her husband's death in 1898 um, and got an architect to put it up and she wanted it to look like like a palace in Venice because mm-hmm. uh, that was her favorite place to go mm-hmm. and she died in 1924 so let's talk about the heist in the early hours of March 18th 1990 security guards opened the door for two men who were posing as police officers responding to a disturbance so they broke they actually broke protocol letting them in um, cause they let them in through the employee entrance entrance. Mm-hmm. So what these police officers ended up doing, they tied up the guards there. They, um, handcuffed the guards in the basement, duct taped them. And then they started taking paintings. All of this happened in a total of 81 minutes. So in all, there were 13 pieces of work stolen valued at over $500 million. What? Yes. During this time, the museum was in the midst of updating their outdated security system. Mm. It's the 90s. So that's basically why it was a little bit easier for them, number one. Number two, there were also um, motion detectors. So their movements were recorded, but not not them. Okay, so it was not video recording. There was video recording, but it, they destroyed it. Oh, that makes sense. Um, the best-known works of art. Uh, were taken from the Dutch room. So lots of Rembrandt paintings, Rembrandt's Christ in the Storm on the Sea of Gal- Galilee, and A Lady and a Gentleman in Black were cut from the frames. And to this day, there's like still missing, like the frames are just there and there's oh no God. art. It's crazy. So they were never recovered. They were never recovered. And there's actually, I read an article about an app that you can download that is like a like virtual reality and if you like hover it over the empty frame it'll show you the where like oh, what cool. painting it was what the painting looked like that was taken oh wow um so they also took vermeer's the concert and flink's landscape with an obelisk from landscape with an obelisk a- obelisk obelisk obelisk, he obelisk? Said yeah is that that is that the like or snake? obelisk i guess that snake eating its own tail no, I think an obelisk is just like um, like a um, 
you know, a sphere. Oh. It's like a one of those things you, like, look into, like you put it in your garden. Oh. I think so. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so those were stolen. He stole an ancient Chinese bronze goo, which is a beaker. Oh. And a self-portrait done by Rembrandt. And the short gallery was uh, another room that was on the same floor. Five Degas drawings, uh, a bronze eagle finial, and from the blue room, Manet, I want to say Manet. 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 Chaise Torton. Manet's Chaise Tortoni was taken. I know nothing about <laughs> um, historical art. Yeah. So I'm apologize <laughs> i am apologize <laughs> uh, yes so during the heist an alarm went off that told the guards that someone like was getting too close to the paintings mm-hmm. but they found it and smashed it like they like straight up destroyed it wow and the only way the police are alerted um when that happens is if the guard goes to the alarm and presses the button And that will call the police. Wow. And so it's a flawed system, and that's also another reason why it was being updated. Right. So the thieves left at 2.45 a.m. The guards that were handcuffed in the basement, they uh, just basically, like, had to stay there until the morning shift people came. Mm. But they couldn't get in. So they had to, like, call the police to, like, get into the museum, and then they found them. Wow. Uh, And so there was an investigation. It's actually still... A thing. It's like they're still so actively fun. investigating. Mm-hmm. It's being investigated by the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. So there is a ten million dollar award currently, which um, initially was half that, but in March 2017 they they doubled it. It was five million. Now then they made it to ten million. Mm-hmm. Um, reward for leading directly to the recovery of all 13 works in good condition. Um, which they are found sometimes. I mean, I've heard many stories about. Stolen art being found even, like, decades later. Yeah. So it definitely could happen. Yeah. Um, so it had an expiration date of midnight on December 31st of that year, of 2017, but it was extended to 2018 because of the outpouring of tips. So there was no motive or pattern or anything that was ever, ever found. No evidence of anything. Um, the selection of works were also weird um, because there was more valuable artworks totally available hmm. and they were there for a long time like the, they could have taken whatever they wanted so their choices were were strange especially since the most valuable one there the rape of europa um is the most valuable one and that wasn't hmm. taken at all yeah um so because of how they were taken they were cut from frames and two of the dega sketches frames were actually just smashed they think that these criminals were amateurs and not, right. like, art heists, like, art thieves right. who were, like, They probably weren't or stealing it for themselves. Yeah, that's kind of what it seems like. They were definitely taking it to sell. Right. Um, there was also a five-year statute of limitations, and that's expired, so thieves can't really face charges, I guess. It's only five years? Yeah. That's crazy. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Um, So in 2010, that's what Wikipedia said anyway. Mm -hmm. In 2010, the FBI announced that they were sending DNA evidence from the original crime scene to Quantico, Virginia for retesting. But it was revealed um, that some of the evidence, such as the handcuffs and the duct tape that was used to tie up the guards, was missing even after an exhaustive search. Which that seems to happen a lot. Really? Where cold cases, the evidence is just like, or the files or whatever, it's just like, oh yeah, it's not there anymore. Like, we put it in a box, like, 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and then, it's not like, there. And then, like, we went and looked again, and, like, it's just not there. It's like, well, what happened? And Some, like, like, tech moved it or something. So, yeah, someone thought it'd be cool to take it home. Someone, like, accidentally spilled their coffee on it and felt embarrassed, just threw it away. Like, who fucking knows? Yeah, you never know. But I guess over a couple of decades, anything could happen. Yeah. So, in August of 2015, police released a video from the night before the theft that is believed to be a dry run of the robbery. Mm. So it shows two men. One remains unidentified, but the other was confirmed as Richard Abbott, one of the security guards who was on duty that night. Abbott 
was looked at as a potential conspirator, Mm -hmm. but he was deemed to, quote, unimaginative. (laughs) He's uh, he's too stupid to have done this. Yes. He will. We'll talk about it. Backhanded compliment, I guess. (laughs) So according to BuzzFeed Unsolved, they had a lot of different details and I don't know why, but the video was being weird and I couldn't figure out where they got their sources because I couldn't read the anyway, whatever. Um, So Richard E. Abbott, he was a music school dropout and part of a rock band. He worked at the museum at night. So he, both of the guards on that night were like amateurs, um, like new, they were like new guys. Mm -hmm. Um, And he admitted that he often came to his shifts drunk and or stoned after performing at a concert. (laughs) Oh, that inspires confidence. I know, right? Um, and because there were St. Patrick's Day celebrations going on that night, police coming to investigate a disturbance, like, made, like, seemingly, I guess, made sense. Mm. Um, and that's why he initially let them in. So what they did was they, they, he lets them in and he go, Abbott goes, sits back down at the desk and they're like, hey, you look familiar. I think we have, like, a warrant on you. And he's like, let's see some ID. And so he makes him get up get out, get away from the desk because under the desk is the only button that Uh, immediately calls the police. Smart. So they, quote, arrest him. um, And then the other security guard walked in, too, and then they arrested him, too. Uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved also mentioned that the security tapes were later destroyed. Uh... When interviewed by the police, Abbott said he couldn't remember what they looked like and that the police sketch was, quote, awful. <laughs> he later said that one of them looked like Colonel Kink from Hogan's Heroes. Oh, that's why you're asking me if I'd watched Hogan's Heroes. Yes. But I wanted <laughs> yeah, that, to that mention it pretty... to anybody else who, who, if they've seen Hogan's Heroes, to right. think of that. <laughs> yeah, think, think of him. Um, but no, it seems strange that he would, like, not remember what they looked like. I mean... They didn't knock him out or anything, right? No, but he also talks about how he was like, yeah, I come to work drunk and stoned sometimes, but oh, not true. that night. <laughs> oh, pff, yeah, right. <laughs> but that particular night, I was totally I straight. I was fine. <laughs> you know, like, totally. Okay, so let's talk about some leads and some theories. In 1994, a letter was sent to the museum promising the return of the piece of the of the pieces for $2.6 million. The only condition was that they had to publish a coded message or something in the Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. Uh, The story was published, but nothing ever came of it. Like, Mm. it just happened. Like, nothing. That was it. Um, Bobby Donati, a Boston gangsta, was (laughs) believed... That was good, right? (laughs) No. (laughs) You're supposed to say yes. Oh, uh, yes. From Boston. I don't know. I can't can't fucking do it. How do you like them apples? Them apples. (laughs) Avid Yard. Avid Yard. Um, he <laughs> the was Boston believed, Red Sox. Red Sox. He was believed to be the perpetrator, Bobby Donati, which is nice because his name rhymes. Um, art thief. Bobby Donati. Bobby Donati. Bobby Donati. Bobby Donati. Bobby Donati. That's how Nicki Minaj Roll up it. in the Ferrari. With the hoodie. <laughs> sure. Bobby Donati. <laughs> <laughs> um... So art thief Miles J. Connor Jr., who was in prison at the time of the robbery, said that he and Donati had scoped out the museum before. Donati was also reportedly seen at a nightclub with a sack of police uniforms shortly before the robbery. Hmm. Um, At one point, he visited um, this other crime boss in prison, Vincent Ferrara, and reportedly told him that he, quote, buried the stuff, end quote. Another suspect is Robbie, quote, Bobby the Cook, Gentile, uh, from Hartford, Connecticut. He's another, like, gangster dude who's been tied. He's also been tied to the crime. His home was searched by the FBI in 2012, but nothing was ever found. Um, Even, like, which I thought this was funny. His, like, son uh, knows where, like, one of his hiding spaces is, and he shows the FBI, like, a false floor. Ooh. But there wasn't anything in there. Okay. Um... The only thing they found was a sheet of paper in the basement listing how much each one would be sold for on the black market. Oh, that's pretty suggestive. Yeah. The F- I also, my kind of theory is that it was passed between a lot of hands and that it's possible that every person could have been a part of it. Sure. 
But the initial people, they have no idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, the FBI uh, forced gun charges on him to, in order to make him reveal the location of the paintings. Uh, prosecutor, so I think he went, I think he went to like a hearing or something. A prosecutor said that uh, Gentile and mob partner Robert Guarante tried to return to the stolen pieces to reduce their prison sentences. Uh, Guarante's wife told investigators that. Uh, her husband uh, once had some of them in his possession, but he gave two of them to Gentile before Gu- Gu- Guarante died of cancer in uh, 2004. Gentile also told at least three other people that he had knowledge of the stolen artwork while he was in prison in 2013 to 2014. So it's a lot of a lot of hearsay and a lot of big talk. Someone knows something. Someone though. knows something for sure. His home was searched again in 2016, but nothing was ever found. Very mysterious. The end. Very, very mysterious. So, yes, Wikipedia, BuzzFeed Unsolved, Wikipedia. and the GardnerMuseum.org information. They oh, have, like, a sense. whole page on the theft. Mm-hmm. That definitely makes sense. And they had a number you can call on any and everything. Very cool. Do you think it's time for weird, weird shit, shit in, in the, the news? news? Weird, weird shit in the news. news. What, what? What is it? It's weird. It's super fucking weird. So weird. So I have two. (laughs) Cool. And the first one, I'll just do the first one. I talked to you about this. Um, Happened August 16th. Uh, It's an article in the Toronto City News, and it says by news staff. So I don't know what really that means. It just says by news staff. Sure. And the title is City Finally Fixing Sinkhole After Fed Up Residents Grew Tomatoes in It. Woo! Good for you. It was a good, like... I love it. Like, what's that called? Like, passive-aggressive? Passive passive resistance. Passive resistance. Yes. Passive resistance. And they're, like, big. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're, like, they were, like, successful tomatoes. That's awesome. And so they've finally taken action. Um, There was a gaping... Oh, it wasn't... It wasn't... Yeah, it was a sinkhole. So there was a gaping sinkhole there for weeks, um, and they never did anything about it. And people, like, were requesting. They, like... Um, uh, talked to the the city, and you know nothing ever came of it. Um, but they decided to stage a very healthy protest, turning it into a tomato garden. <laughs> so it like aired on on the news, and then they were like, "Okay, we'll fix it." <laughs> it shamed him into it. Yeah, I love it. The city says it's transferring the plant the plants to a community garden. Win win. If everybody comes out okay, even, Everything even the fucking okay. tomatoes. Wow, look at that. That is a pretty extensive uh, sinkhole, yeah. Yeah. Cray, cray. That's one. You can do the next Good. one. Good. I'll do the, on to the next one. On, on to, to the, the next, next one. one. So, story by Sarah G. Miller in CBS News. Woman's lost contact lens found in her eyelid... 28 years later. Ew. Yeah. So this lady from the United Kingdom was uh, 14 years old when apparently she was hit with a shuttlecock and badminton in her eye. And her contact lens, which is like a hard Whoa. lens, went like around. Ah! And 28 years later, ah. doctors found the missing eye contact embedded in a cyst in her left ah. eyelid. Yep. Uh, Super pleasant Ah. to think about. So her left eyelid had always been a little bit droopy. She figured, oh, whatever. She never really worried about it too much, I guess, for 28 years or whatever. But when they did look into it, after it it was like getting worse, they found a cyst measuring about 8 by 4 by 6 millimeters and uh, just above her left eye. And the doctors then surgically removed the cyst and inside of it, was an extremely fragile, hard contact lens. They eventually figure out, oh, it was this thing that happened way back when, when I was 14, and the, um, you know, doctors treat her, and essentially she was totally fine. She's Um, good? (laughs) Yeah, she's pretty good, so still can see. Good good for her. Uh, Apparently she also never wore contact lenses, like, ever after that happened, and it They say that it's still a mystery why the contact lens only caused swelling and inflammation like nearly 
three decades later. Like, why huh. didn't why didn't this happen like a long time ago? Right, but they're they're not sure. So, yeah, that's uh my little weird. medical mystery. So there was a cyst. Right, a cyst, Ew. like a fluid filled sac that had like Ew. developed around it. Because I guess that's the body's way of dealing with it, right? It's like, oh, there's some weird foreign object. Like, okay, just put it inside of a bubble and, like, leave it. Like, it'll be fine. Which it kind of mostly was. So, did you have any others? I do have one more. Okay, cool, go. It's weird. Okay. Um, It's, like, funny and kind of sad. Cool. Uh, So, this is from some weird website called joe.ie. Sounds totally legitimate. I, I don't know. Um, Kate DeMolder wrote this article. The title's Irish teenager injured when hit by falling sheep in Mourne Mountains. What? So this was in Ireland. Um, he's been hospitalized an incident which saw him being hit by falling sheep while walking in the mountains. So he went hiking with, um, like a group of his friends and I don't know what a crag is. A crag? It's like a rocky outcrop, I believe. That's where the sheep fell from. Oh, okay. Um, so he was actually... Um, hold on, let me see. Okay, he it's was... It's rain and sheep. Hallelujah, it's rain and sheep. Can you imagine? <laughs> yes. So he was, quote, assessed and treated for a range of potential injuries, including head, neck, back, abdominal, and leg in- injuries. Fuck. He was evacuated by a stretcher to track access and a team vehicle. Yeah, it was crazy. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Pretty weird. Rain and sheep out here. It says the sheep involved in the accident was uninjured in the incident and left the area unaided. (laughs) So it's like, oh, okay, bye. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. What's going (laughs) on? Thanks for the soft landing, man. Appreciate it. Just runs off. (laughs) That's a, uh, it's a a fall on and run, I guess. A little, little vertical hit and run. So I have one more, uh, but it's more of a good shit in the news. Yeah. Um, so it's about, uh, or it's a story rather by Katie Keck on uh, Inverse. And the headline is, this fearless 17-year-old is America's best bet for making it to Mars. I think I've heard of this girl. Yeah, so her name I'm is really proud of her. Alyssa Carson. And apparently she has been thinking about going to Mars Continually since she was like three years old. <gasps> yeah, she that saw, means she's super special, right? That she, means it's meant to be. She saw an episode of like some kids show about it. I forget what. Oh, the backyard again. <gasps> Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Okay, I've never heard of it, but there was an episode I guess about a mission to Mars, and that inspired her. And she's yeah, just been working super fucking hard. She's like taking college courses alongside her high school courses like learning about all different kinds of sciences oh nice and she wants to be a astrobiologist we were just talking about wow, astrobiology we on our aliens that. episode yeah so she wants to do that and like be one of the people who like gets to go to mars for the first time yes so she's right now you know working on becoming the youngest astronaut of all time that's like her her like short-term goal to like get to space before she's like not a teenager anymore and then work with like whoever to to get to mars like could be nasa um or this collaboration that nasa has with the canadian space agency or you know she's also working with a dutch based group i think mars one i believe uh or you know elon musk or or like whatever she's like i don't care i just want to go to mars and like it's so cute because it's like her, her dad talks a lot about it. It's like, you know, we may never see her again. Like, who knows if they would even be able to come back. There's all these, like, health consequences because your, your risk of cancer is going to go, like, way, way up. So, yeah, she says that she, like, understands the risks and, you know, what it, it's, like, going to take to be a part of the mission. But that she's, like, fucking down for it. It's like, I don't yes. care, you know, if if I never come back. You know, I just want to, like, get to Mars. So it's just, like, super inspiring, I think. So that was my good shit. Good shit in the news. Good shit in the news. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. So, yeah, that's, uh, those are our mysteries. 
for this week. We did it. Yay! We actually recorded before the last minute. Go team! <laughs> yeah, we're actually recording on Sunday right now. <laughs> so yeah. I'm gonna like actually edit this episode and shit. It's like crazy. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, so thanks so much for listening, y'all. Um, we have been really, you know, um, excited cause we're like growing up our listenership. Uh, we're, we're getting like people listening from all over the fucking world. Um, you know, still getting a lot of listens from, you know, like Australia. I love that. That's like so fucking cool to me. <laughs> There's like people sitting in Australia, like listening to us, but a lot from, you know, like Philadelphia, we've been getting a lot from, um, let's see, what are some of, like, the top, uh, cities lately? So, yeah, we've been getting a lot from, like, Canada. Uh, thank you. Canada. Uh, America's hat, I appreciate it. America's hat. <laughs> no, we, we, lo- we love y'all up in, uh, the Canada. Um, so, yeah, Philly a lot, like, a lot from Omaha, um, you know, Madison. We've, c- of course, been getting some, you know, here in, in, uh, normal. Chloe. Oh, no. Chloe went out and did some uh, some marketing for us uh, yesterday or the day before, or whatever. Some as as chalk marketing. As 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 menial as marketing can be. You know what though? Like that's what you do. Like when you're at the very beginning, like you you pound the pavement, you get out there, you do it yourself. We've DIY. Right, you DIY it. Remember, like when we were doing the Twenty Seven Club episode, and we were talking about how um, Kurt Cobain would go and like drop off the demo tapes like at the radio stations oh himself, hell yeah and be like driving home and hear the song and be like oh my oh my god oh they're playing our song I, like i just gave that to them like oh that's amazing uh like that's that's where we are right now you know but uh go team you know team mystery team mystery we're gonna keep working on it keep getting better um but yeah if you want to con- uh you know contribute to the cause uh go over to our patreon page patreon.com slash mystery murder thingy um and P A T R E O N, and give us a dollar so we can give you a shout out. Individualized. Say my name, say my name. We just no one is also around you. Recorded. Say, baby, I love you. <laughs> we just also recorded a new weird news extra. So, uh, g- give us that five bucks for that, and you'll get all of those. Yay! And yeah, it's gonna be great. Um. Yeah. Did you have any final words? Tell your friends. Tell your friends, friends. Tell all your social media friends who you don't even fucking know um, that you've never talked to even once. And you're like, did I meet that person at a bar? I don't even remember. Why am I clicking add them as a friend right now? But it, like, doesn't really cost me anything, so I'm just going to do it. Tell yeah. that person. That was uh, a really good, like, oh, thinking process right? of, like, what that's like. We all have those people on our Facebook friend page. You I you know, recently, periodically delete them, but before you do, tell them about our podcast. I recently did a whole, like, clean out, which was... You got to. Kind of nice. You got to. Got to. Got to happen. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's uh, pretty much it. Yay. Good job by you. Bye. 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 Bye.